Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. It's our last week in Richmond. I'm being very quiet because I made a promise. I made a promise that I would. Um, I made a promise that I would not go in super early today, <laughs> um, and that I would. Um, that I would take today really smoothly. My chief of staff, which I'm excited for everyone to get to know when we come back to Richmond. Her name is Stephanie and she had a long sit down with me yesterday about what today is going to look like. Um, and fair warned me that I was gonna take it slow. So I'm still at my Airbnb. That's where I stayed the entire time that I was here. It was really important. Um, to me, good morning. It was really important to me to have consistency. You know, we all have our things, right? Um, so some people do hotel living. Me, I, I like consistency, feeling like I'm coming home in a way. And I know that's probably was confusing to my family as I said, hey, I, I gotta go home <laughs> to Richmond. But um, so I'm not in the office today because of uh, this week is gonna be it's gonna be, I don't know, I don't know what to expect, but I've, I was given several warnings. One, keep a lot of snacks on my desk. Two, also keep snacks for my neighbors, cause that might be fun. Um, and three, just be prepared to hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. Good morning, Clifton. It's so, Cliff, it's so good to see you this morning. So what I know about this week, uh, um, what I know about this week, I'll touch on that for a second. I'm gonna hit the second. Um, today actually I'm getting myself dressed uh, we have this program and I really want to make sure I put this out to folks in our community because I don't think we have a lot of little citizens doing it in our area we have a program here in the capital called the pages program and the pages program is for 13 and 14 year olds they come up here they spend the whole session here they get this it's, it's eighth graders or 14 13, 14 year olds from across the Commonwealth. They come, they have their uniforms, they get paid weekly, they do their homework. It is a beautiful program. Do you hear me? Like a beautiful program to give them some opportunity to be a part of this process. So today they've been spending the whole session, um, you know, cat not catering, but they ask us questions, they go get stuff for us, they do these different things. But for the past few weeks, they've been be being mini legislators where they are developing bills and um, several of them have come by the office and said, Delegate Glass, can you, can you read my bill? Can you help me prepare to present my bill? Because today is the day where those 13 and 14 year olds will come onto the house floor and they will present their bills as if they are legislators. Like this is the build up for them. So what I do wanna do is next session, at the end of next year, we've got to get as many of our little citizens uh, prepared to be a part of the PAGE program because I think it's a once in a lifetime experience. So today, I will become a page today. So it's just like we're doing a roll swap. I'm gonna go sit in the little seats where the pages sit, and then they're gonna sit in our seats, and I'm gonna go get them their coffee or their paperwork or whatever. So it'll be exciting for us today. Now that's what that's what today looks like, and this week we'll be doing a lot of conferencing of bills. Um, so what has happened is is those bills we talked about went through the house went through the senate the senate will make say hey i want to make changes to this this house bill the house is like yo we like this bill but we got to make changes to it so we've been doing a lot this week will be a lot of conferencing well you see a couple people from the house a couple people from the senate they're going to get together and like little they make meet right outside the doors of a chamber and talk about the bill come to an agreement if they can't come to the agreement the bill is dead if they can then we go back to our respective chamber where the the bill originated and we vote to either accept or um reject whatever those amendments are and that'll be happening all week back and forth back and forth back and forth so it is going to be a long week i'm actually working on saturday as well which i don't know call me call me crazy i just i i uh, only scheduled my airbnb till saturday not really realizing that saturday is a work day so i'll be working all week um monday through saturday and maybe be home on Sunday. 
Yeah, that is so cool. So uh, Conrad just said, Republicans just killed a bill to restructure marijuana sentence for those already uh, incarcerated. Conrad, what I would love to do, because we've got sort of a, I have a slower morning with you and I don't have uh, privileges in elections committee this morning. I'd love you to come in and talk a little bit about the bill and your thoughts on it if you'd like to. Um, I'm gonna send you a request, okay? If you'd like to join. Um, because I think it's a good opportunity to like uh, um, what I'd like to start doing in the mornings is to give folks the opportunity to sort of ask questions, come in, talk, and really be a part of what we're doing here um, um, in Richmond and once we get back home in Norfolk. So you you can come in and, and talk a little bit about that. They just killed that bill to restructure the marijuana sentences. Um, that's, that's, that speaks vol volumes. Um, and, um, what else can you say about that other than express frustration? The thing about these bills is, uh, fortunately, we can bring them back next year. Um, what's going to be really interesting if you guys have not been paying attention, um, we have, but have not sunk our teeth into it is that redistricting is, we're going to find out some more information about what's happening with redistricting. Um, what I mean by redistricting is, you know, our right now we're all elected on obsolete maps. Every 10 years when we have our census, we re -updo the, uh, redo the maps and um, no one's been elected on the maps that we, that are based off the 2020 census. That should have happened in October. Um, I mean, that should have happened this past November so that everyone should have ran off of new maps, but because that commission they created that redistricting commission, if you weren't paying attention over the summer or it just wasn't a thing, like for, for, for some is like, it just wasn't on my radar. Um, they, we voted to have redistricting 2021, right? And we voted how we were going to do it. And the way in which we did it made it really partisan. So the, the, the commission that was assigned to do the redistricting couldn't get it done, right? They, it was so partisan that they just, they couldn't get it done. And then, uh, so a judge had to step in and our Supreme Court had to have these two guys draw these maps instead of the commission doing it cooperatively. And so it took so long that it passed the election day. You can't just hold up, no, hold up the uh, election for maps. So everybody ran on old maps. So the sentiment is, is we've got a lot of people saying, hey, in order to be in line with voters' rights, the maps need to be updated because the old maps were gerrymandered as heck. And gerrymandered means fixed so that, um, in, a, in a way, so that a certain class of people, group of people would be in the same district, no matter what it takes. And some of them draw, they ugly. <laughs> Pretty much the maps is ugly. It don't look, you know, ugly in the sense of you can have somebody right here and then a small piece of land and then right here. Like that's, that's that piece. So it's going to be really imperative that um, if we want to get things like sentencing, restructuring for marijuana for those people that are already incarcerated, um, that we really press our legislators in this next election cycle about what their beliefs are and vote accordingly. That's that's the whole truth. Nothing but the truth. Conrad, does anybody, you can request to, uh, I'm going to stop that ad. If you'd like to come on and ask a question, please do not hesitate. Just drop in the comments and say, hey, I want to come on and ask you a question or talk about something specifically, something specific that's happening in the community or um, or otherwise. Um, if you have not noticed... <laughs> I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the fact that, you know, gas prices are doing that thing that they do when you have sanctions. Um, oh, signals going in and out here. Let me let me see. I'm making sure that's not me. OK. Yep. Good morning. Um, gas prices are doing that thing that they do. Um, they're going up. I um, mean, they are uh, show Cardi B in, okay, because it, it, it's up. up. Um, let me see. Clifton, I'm going to try to bring you, see if, see if I can add you in. Um, 
they're going up and that's to be expected. Several weeks ago, we talked about this, right? We kind of talked about how we could expect the fact that the gas prices were going to be going up some food prices. It's not because we have, I think we only get about 10% of our uh, oil from, um, from Russia or only import. It's not a lot of much imported from them. However, uh, they have a lot of raw materials. And so when we talk about making um, bread, <laughs> when we talk about making a lot of the things that make sense uh, that we buy in stores, that we're going to be directly Im impacted by that. And it just, it, we haven't necessarily seen the, we have not seen the full effect of it, but it's it's starting. Um, my main concern right now uh, what's cool with what's going on over there is the length of time uh, that Russia is there, the, the more implications that we're walking ourselves towards something bigger. Um, I fully think, I, I fully expected uh, things are moving a little, I'm not going to say slow, but slower than I would have expected, um, considering the sizable amount of troops and things that were sent over there. But um, this is, this is, if it becomes a long game, then we can expect an even longer game and probably an even bigger, um, <sighs> expecting the worst, uh, um, um, there. So, uh, when we get back to, uh, Virginia, so we've got, uh, like I said, till the end of the week, transitioning to the, so what, now what, uh, what are we going to do when we're not in Richmond? What's going to happen? You we only got a week left. So what happens? Um, like, I, I think I said this before, for state legislators, 80% of our job is done outside of Richmond. We only spend a, a that finite amount of time here. So what we've been doing is we've set up our, um, it is difficult to find office space <laughs> in uh in in our area uh, that is reasonable because it is, it's not... Um, it's a part, it's fully part-time, right? So um, having office space with the reasonable amount of um, funding that we get from the state to maintain an office is what we're trying to do. Uh, we've already committed to at least three times a week. Um, at, at least this is the conversation and I would love to hear your suggestions because we wanna make sure that there's access and opportunity to talk to our staff in the office to help because we've been able to help people with employment stuff. We're still working with folks um, in the prison system. Um, people are having issues with SNAP and getting their businesses set up. Like our job is a lot of case management and just having resources to be able to dole out or be able to point folks in the right direction. Um, but it's so important that you you have the opportunity and access to this office. Um, we will be at least once a week having in-person office hours. At the very minimum, once a week, in-person office hours um, and one town hall a month. And remember, I truly believe in a town hall in every sense. When you say a town hall, you shut up and listen. <laughs> and that's what we will be doing, shutting up and and listening and then um and then another office hours that rotates around the district so one will be in a consistent place the town hall will be at a consistent time and then three will have another opportunity where we sort of rotate ourselves around uh the district uh, making sure that we're able to get to folks and that's what we're trying at least three um, in-person touch points um a month um and then launching our policy work groups probably in um, in June. So hang tight, we'll be doing that as well. Um, and again, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, do not hesitate to drop them in the um, drop them in the um, um, in the chat. Yet, yeah, Denise, look, I I saw your name. Um, you've already signed up. But uh, to to help out, so Denise says I can help out with case management if you need it. We absolutely, it's all hands on deck uh, for what's probably going to be needed in the next um, era of of our lives here because there are so many things going on in Norfolk right now. We've got people still transitioning in and out of the city, and this is local government stuff, right? And so, let me just be honest: there are many things on the local government level that are going to directly impact 
what is happening on the state level and vice versa right and then and same thing with the with the federal level what i foresee is because of much of the things that are happening are going to be happening in our city we've got this uh pop-up shop casino that they're uh about to do we've got people moving out um people moving in um we've got um economic development that is sizable in nature so i see procurement questions state level wise i see employment questions right unemployment and employment as what's happening around the world shifts people's uh daily lives and affordability of things is going to change um um and then i see resources as you know we venture into this brave new world of having gambling being a part of our city's uh economy and culture um, so we are definitely going to need a lot of um, support with case management. What I'd encourage you to do, Denise, and anybody else that's like, hey, I'd love to help with this particular thing, um, is let me know if there's a certain area of expertise. Um, I am currently looking for folks that specialize in um, working with the prison population. Whether you know it or not, a lot of my hand mail, like a lot of mail that I get at the P.O. box are from incarcerated persons asking for help with their case or with their quality of life inside the prison system. Um, and what this office can do is we can ask the questions, right? I can have someone from the team call up a particular person in the Department of Corrections, get updates for families, like um, um, <laughs> get updates for families and 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 do things like that. But I do want people to know and understand that we genuinely um, while we cannot solve every problem, we're going to exhaust our resources to get an answer in some way, shape or form. That makes sense. So, uh, Conrad says, a uh, bet against the commanders. And so that comment is important too. That's an important piece of Virginia, uh, Virginia's, um, economy. If I'm saying this right, good morning, Shar. So what Conrad says on bet against the commanders, if you don't know, the former Washington football or former Washington Redskins, also former Washington football team, now the Washington Commanders are um, are being wooed here by folks in the Northern Virginia area. We had a bill, uh, actually two bills. One was on the House side, one was on the Senate side. They were the same bill. Now that's that happens all the time, right? That those bills identical bills happening on um, both sides. They just gives this the bill the opportunity to pass two folds, right? So if the one, the, the House bill passes and the Senate bill passes, most times they'll uh, go ahead and um, join those two together and, um, and, uh, and it'll be come law. So, or they'll be considered companion bills. Uh, there was a bill to have a football authority right, to develop a football authority with so many legislators, so many people from the community, so many, uh, if you, fun fact, oh, I'll finish this first, right, the football authority. The football authority would come together and see like the viability of having a stadium and all these different things. Now, personally, I read the bill <laughs> and it sounds like, yeah, that's, you know, bringing football here would be great. But I know historically what football stadiums have done to distressed areas. One, I don't like that. Two, inside of the bill, I didn't like the tax structure that was set up. I do not believe that uh, that any that a football team need that we need to pay for it. And it was being sold to folks as, hey, you don't have to pay for it. It's going to pay for itself. So. Um, how does that happen when it generates revenue? That revenue is going to go back into paying for itself. Um, Hold on a second. Yeah, it's going to go back into paying for itself, which means you do not get the benefit of having the revenue from said <laughs> from from the football stadium. So you essentially are paying for it because this thing is taking up space and Virginians, it's taking up space in our community and we're getting no benefit from it until it pays for itself itself. So it sounds like it does come at a cost. Right. Um, it, and as I've uh, been, you know, getting more and more information on it, it it's a huge tax break for for folks that have the ability to make this happen at a snap. And I just don't think that we should be um, 
providing incentives in that way. If we're going to give tax breaks, if we're going to do things that make sense that that uh, add value to the community while also keeping everyday folks uh, happy, employed, and not lacking, then we do it for everyday folks. We don't do it for billionaires or millionaires, whatever they are. So there's that. Um, thank you, Denise. You said you we work with a mental health court. Oh, wow. Um, we definitely have to connect it. We've been talking about veterans courts and housing courts and different specialized courts in the area, having some good conversation. Uh, okay, so it would be more community bench official for the state to do house buying assistance for first timers, yeah. And that's where I come off as, and I'll be quite honest with you about that bill when it came up. Um, uh, how do I say this kindly? There are some very interested folks that are really bought in, legislators that are really bought in, that were really pushy about voting against the bill. And I'm not 100% sure that they, I mean, who knows what the repercussions will be, but people pay attention when you don't vote for their stuff. They There may be retaliation. There may be, you know, um, later on, but I just, I try to, guys, when I'm voting on things and when I'm doing, I just remember, I remind myself why I'm in Richmond and that people sent me here and that when I make the decision, I try to take into account the demographics, uh, the quality of life of of communities and people and not necessarily just the interests of one lobbyist, one legislator uh, or one leader, whatever that is like. That's what I have to take into account first. And so while it may um, there probably will be consequences for voting against it, uh, I just don't believe in doing that to Virginian residents at, at all. And there are a lot of people I know that voted for it that didn't want to because they didn't want to deal with the aftermath of having it uh, with some of our, you know, colleagues wanting the bill to pass. It did, it did pass, but, you know, um, it comes at a cost. Um, fun fact, when we talked about um, the uh, the stadium authority, the Hampton Roads area also has what's called an arena authority. And right now there are military circle has three plans that our city council is looking into three, right? Two of them have an arena. And what we do know is like a city like ours can't really sustain an arena in that way. Or like, it's going to come it like, just like the football stadium, it will come at a cost, right? And we don't want that cost to go back to, to you. Right. And so the, that's what that arena authority was, is when our region comes together and they talk about how they can fund it together so that um, it doesn't depress or distress one city. Right. We all take ownership in it. We put our chips in together to make it happen so that it doesn't come in a cost. So I'm, I'm going to be really paying attention to that as what I have to consider, just like Conrad said, is how these things affect the quality of life of people around that area and what resources we have on the state level that will be available to them. So um, first time home buying, right? Like um, we, we're still divvying out ARPA funds. Like are we investing that into spaces where we are creating opportunities? Like there's still these little nuanced things, resources and dollars that we can be paying a heavy, heavy amount of a, a, attention to. I see, I saw um, Char on here next week there or the week after next and I will be putting a flyer up. Uh, the, this is Women's History Month, if you guys didn't know. Uh, Women's History Month, um, I actually did my floor speech yesterday for Women's History Month about Racy Taylor, um, who was a woman that was, um, um, I say assaulted to success. Her her trauma created, uh, was a catalyst for the civil rights movement. But as we talk about Women's History Month, right? And then we connect that to, you all know I'm a vet. I didn't start this off by saying, hello, I'm a mama, a Navy vet certified doer and delegate. Um, what happened is, is the third week of March in the state of Virginia is also known as Women's Veterans Week. Um, at the state level, there will be a women's veterans ceremony um, happening um, here in Richmond, and I'll be coming back up to it, but I want to put that invitation out to you, state uh, 
connected to the page as we put the flyer out. I think the flyer got approved the end of last week. So our team will be putting the posting the flyer here pretty soon about um about that event. We need as many folks uh that represented or coming as possible. The state of Virginia has the largest, you ready to see my whole mouth? The largest, the largest population of women veterans in the United States. We have over a hundred and nine thousand women veterans right um so we are really making sure that this uh office and that this administration does what it can what it can to hold on to these women right to uh to be to care for them because there's a specific kind of uh uh, uh um i don't want to say hurt but there's a specific the experience is different. Yes, Conrad, please. And if you have a woman veteran that you know that is just out here doing the daggum thing, please shout her out. So Susan Bates Hippin or Master Chief, which is an E9, an enlisted, uh, the highest rank for enlisted, uh, almost the highest, unless you um, become a McFarland, which you're still a Master Chief um, rank Um um, in the Navy, she is a huge advocate, active, is politically active in the Virginia Beach space. We got Shark Covington who just said good stuff. She's going to try to make it. I will make sure you get this retired Navy. You know, like um, there is a lot of opportunity and I'm pushing it. I'll tell you right now, when I got elected, we, I think I told y'all this, we doubled the number of women veterans in the legislature, which means we went from one to two. <laughs> so right now I'm the only female veteran in the house and um, Jen, Senator Kiggins, Jen Kiggins is the only female veteran in the Senate. Um, uh, but what we've done intentionally with intent y'all, because what we realize military is a culture and it, it touches the fabric of every single city across the Commonwealth. Um, we brought in some children. So there are a lot of members who are military, I hate to say brats, but are military cultured children, right? Uh, yep. Yep, that she there, there's been so I want them to be a part of this because a lot of the push has been recently about how do we take care of military families as a whole. Here's where everyone is about to start benefiting from um, when when uh, what, what everybody is about to start benefiting from the military's priorities. So every Wednesday I have been. Um, Every Wednesday, I've been going to this thing called a caucus for a military, uh, the GAMVIC, the General Assembly uh, Armed Forces and Veterans. I can't even think of the name of caucus right now. Sorry. So I um, uh, in this caucus for the past several weeks, they've been letting us know what are the priorities of all these different military installations across the uh, across the Commonwealth. And I'm going to tell you, number one, child care. <laughs> Even they're having issues with child care. That is one of their number one priorities. Number two, resiliency. Right. Bases are flooding. The infrastructure outside of bases are absolutely Right. So there's a grant program right now out there that we can take advantage of that just passed. And hopefully our city will be able to take advantage of that because we all know Hampton Boulevard ain't no joke. It should not look like that out there when we have federal property sitting. Right. <laughs> so we're looking for ways to get help, but it, it comes at a cost. What happens is, is that the Air Force has already started a process by which they are grading cities and towns for their servicemen and women. And they're grading them and determining what places they want to invest in and they want to invest with their people into. So if the school systems are not good, if there's a lack of child care, transportation and housing, um, they are shifting a lot of their resources and their people to the places where it is. So it's almost like if y'all got kids and y'all do great school, like it's going to be great school for military installations and the military will be conveners. 
Now, I already know in our town, we would get a bunch of Fs, right? If they were grading us, we would not, or, or not tens, twos and threes, right? If they're grading our childcare availability, there is not, there is definitely a childcare desert. Resiliency, if it rains, it floods, right? Like um, um, educational system, we have phenomenal educational, we have phenomenal educators, um, but our system is still in a lot of ways failing certain communities. Um, so then, you know, folks are like, I, I'm going to go to your NGs. I'm going to go to Chesapeake. So I, it sits with me in my chest, the fact that they are going to start grading cities and maybe that'll be a change for us. Maybe it'll like say, Hey, we need to start investing, um, um, in meaningful ways. And maybe we'll get support. Like maybe that'll be a way for the federal government to start partnering with cities to improve the quality of life of the servicemen and women that are within that city because you know having transient folks here i get that you know there's a level of frustration but also a level of economic boom that you get from it but we got to do it yes so the air force always takes care of their people and and they're thinking about standardizing that across the services um wow you got to tell me more about i have to make sure i meet the master chief that owns the 7-eleven in ghent we, we, we be doing stuff where am i at so I'm going to pause for a second and allow space for any questions, comments, or, or anything. If anybody wants to join me, if you want to come into the live, um, I can bring you in. You want to ask a question, you want to we'll leave space. We'll leave space for that. I was just trying to do a time check. Yeah, there we go. We're a little bit over. Anything? Anything? Oh, Conrad said, Elaine King and Elaine... Elena Loria versus Jen Kiggins, two women vets are running for the House District. Yeah, you don't often see women step in what former veteran <laughs> veteran women getting into politics. Uh, my husband said it's because y'all already sick of a structure where uh, where there ain't no hope. Talking about being a part. Of it. He's a whole mess. Um, but it's it's a beautiful thing to see. We want to take care of folks, you know. We want to take care of folks. I feel like I'm missing anything. Um, yep. Last day, I'll repeat and I'll let you guys go. Last day here is going to be uh, on Saturday. Um, Saturday is our last work day. What will happen is on April 27th. Once the, um, I think the, the governor has until the end of March, till March like 30th or something like that, to go through all of our bills and veto the bills that he wants to veto and amend, make changes to bills that he wants to make changes to. And then we're going to come back on the 20, 27th of, um, of April and sort of go through what he's vetoed and the amendments that he made and accept or reject and do all that good stuff. Um, so it's a whole process. I look forward to bringing you guys along with it. So the light is outside and I'm still, I'm still at the Airbnb. That stresses me out, but I'm being obedient because I don't like traffic and I'm going to have to go in the building with traffic. <laughs> I will say this. I'm excited to be back home. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Um, and I will see you guys on Thursday and let you know how the page debate goes. Please, let's start setting up some of these little citizens to be pages is an experience that we cannot, you can't buy it. Okay. All right. So as always, until next time. Oh, did I? Yep. I got everything. Jackie Glass, Mama, Navy Vet Certified.